Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here today to respond to the federal government's continued overreach into the lives of law-abiding firearms owners. Last month, I received a letter from Marco Medicino, the Federal Minister of Public Safety. And in this letter, he was asking that Alberta provide resources to help confiscate firearms starting in the fall of 2022. We're talking about 30,000 firearms all told. To be clear, these firearms were acquired legally. The list of over 1,500 banned models were all previously non-restricted or restricted firearms and include hunting rifles and shotguns as well as historical artifacts almost 100 years old. And while the federal government has labeled them as, in their words, assault style, end quote, that's a label designed to scare Canadians who are unfamiliar with firearms. It's a description based purely on their appearance and not on any unusual danger that they pose or mechanical capability that they possess. Indeed, these f guns are not materially different from any number of semi-automatic rifles and shotguns that continue to be legal for any qualified Albertan to own. This is politically motivated confiscation, pure and simple one that will do nothing to make Alberta a safer place or to reduce the criminal misuse of firearms. And so I responded to Minister Mendicino by telling him that no, Alberta will not assist the federal government in this or any federal effort to strip lawfully obtained personal property from our residents. To challenge this ban, we are also pursuing legal action. Alberta will seek to intervene in six ongoing judicial review applications challenging the constitutionality of the federal firearm prohibition legislation. As interveners, we would be able to offer the court arguments based on the specific challenges that the federal legislation has created for Alberta's law-abiding firearms community and advance legal arguments that the federal government has overreached with its plan to ban 1,500 models of firearms. Upon my instructions, my ministry's lawyers sent a letter to the federal court last week advising it of our plans. We have also been informed by civil servants from Public Safety Canada that the federal government intends to conscript provincial RCMP officers into acting as confiscation agents as part of their, what is their terminology, buyback program, end quote. Now, although I have been advised that the commanding officer for K Division does not support using provincial police resources to administer the federal government's confiscation program, we believe that the federal government will continue with their plans undeterred. Now, it's important to remember that Alberta taxpayers pay over $750 million per year for the RCMP, and we will not tolerate taking officers off the streets in order to confiscate the property of law-abiding firearms owners. To take action, I have used the authorities that we have as a province. Under the Provincial Police Service Agreement, this is the agreement that we have with Canada to contract our, our provincial policing. And I've used these authorities to write to the commanding officer of the RCMP in Alberta to formally identify the confiscation program as an activity that is not an, quote, objective, priority, or goal of the province or the provincial police service, end quote. And that the use of RCMP resources would be contrary to the effective and efficient delivery of police services. Consequently, the RCMP should refuse to participate. Now, despite taking this step, the federal government may still direct the RCMP to serve as confiscation agents. To prevent this from happening, Alberta will formally dispute any attempt to do so by invoking Article 23 of that agreement, the Provincial Police Service Agreement. Our government understands the dangers that come with the criminal misuse of firearms, and we've always been in favor of sensible uh, policies to mitigate those risks. As today's announcement bears out, however, we will never support misguided policies, fear-mongering, or the seizure of private property. I'll now invite Alberta's Chief Firearms Officer, Terry Bryant, to come to the podium to provide some remarks. Thank you. Terry? <coughs> Good 
My position as a provincially appointed Chief Firearms Officer specifies that I have a dual role to supervise the administration of the licensing and other provisions of the Firearms Act in its current form and to advocate for common sense changes to ensure the law remains focused on criminal misuse of firearms and avoids imposing unnecessary burdens on the law-abiding firearms community. In the latter capacity, I have previously expressed strong opposition to the federal government's plans to prohibit and confiscate some 30,000 lawfully acquired firearms from Albertans. These prohibitions were not based on any sound principle or evidence, were not subjected to rigorous parliamentary scrutiny before the order in council was imposed, and have no meaningful connection to any public safety goals. No consultations worthy of the name have been undertaken with respect to the proposed compensation schedule, and no concrete practical plan has been proposed as to how owners would take advantage of it, even if it did exist and they did want to do so. Together with the proposed handgun transfer freeze now before Parliament, the planned confiscations represent a failed approach to reducing violence in Canadian society and are unwarranted and unacceptable infringements on the property rights and personal freedoms of Albertans. All Canadians, whether firearms owners or not, should be concerned by the scapegoating of law-abiding citizens and the targeting of their property, which sets a disturbing precedent, and by the misuse of billions of taxpayer dollars that these plans would entail. Even if these costs can be contained to just $2 billion, that would cover the costs of some 12,000 person years of regulatory and enforcement personnel, or a fully paid 20-year career for some 600 people. I am gratified to see today's announcements as concrete indicators of the steadfast position of Minister Shandro and the Alberta government as a whole to support law-abiding firearms owners and to oppose Ottawa's misguided measures by all means available under current legislative frameworks. I look forward to working with all branches of the Alberta government to ensure that we leave no stone unturned in our efforts to protect Albertans from Ottawa's senseless overreach and to redirect attention to where it belongs, to criminals smuggling, trafficking, and misusing firearms in ways that threaten public safety. Thank you. Thank you very much, CFO Bryant and uh, Minister Shandro. Uh, we'll now uh, start the Q&A portion of today's uh, press conference. Uh, if you do have a question, please uh, line up at the microphone here. Uh, again, please state your name, uh, your affiliation, uh, and you have one question and one follow-up. Please hey go there. ahead. Uh, it's Alana Smith with the Globe and Mail. I have a question for Minister Shandro. Uh, UCP leadership candidate Danielle Smith says Alberta could oppose federal firearms ownership legislation under her proposed Alberta Sovereignty Act. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, I, I think as more details come out from that contestant, we'll learn more. But um, I'm, I'm not prepared to be speaking about the, the proposals that the leadership contestants are discussing when it comes to that legislation or proposed legislation. So in general, you won't give any thoughts on the proposed Alberta Sovereignty Act? Uh, no, I, I think I, I have spoken previously. My concern would be having liability that might be imposed on, on um, private uh, citizens and businesses. That would be a concern of mine, but I, I think we're, we're seeing more details come from that proposal. And um, I, I think there's, there's not, not really much for me to be commenting on at this time on that. You wouldn't say whether you're generally supportive of it or not? Well, I, I, I've said, uh, yeah, I think it was about a couple months ago when I said I had those concerns in particular, and I guess we're getting more, more details on what the, the contestants proposing with that proposed legislation. Thank you very much. Uh, please, next question. Yeah, Bill Lefranc, CTV Minister. Um, does this, what you're announcing today here, this really is, is just a direction to police to please not do what the, feds or the federal government is asking you to do, if I'm not misunderstanding you. What does this really do? Is this, is this just slowing things down? Is this, uh, is this about objecting or like in practical terms for firearms owners that have these things sitting in their safe that they cannot take out, cannot sell, uh, except to the government when they decide to come around with some money? What does this actually do for those people? Well, first of all, what this is about is making sure that we as Canadians, when we have our, our taxpayers being spent on policing, that it actually gets spent on policing. And for us in Alberta, that $750 million is spent on making our community safer, not spent on confiscating firearms from law-abiding citizens. So that's, that's the, the main priority here, making sure 
that our policing dollars go to making sure our communities are safe. Um, for, for those folks who will continue to have uh, concerns, they're right to have those concerns about the next steps that the federal government may be taking because I think as the federal government continues to try and figure out how to operationalize this proposal, more and more Canadians are going to find out how bad of a boondoggle this is proposed to be and they're going to find out even more um, about how, how this is proposed to be, um, well, how this is going to end up in, in mismanagement, I, I think, in, in these ideas. Um, follow up here. Uh, Criminal Defence Lords Association say the province right now $80 million behind in the agreed funding for legal aid. Uh, they say that uh, you've previously said that any change of funding is going to have to wait until the next provincial budget. Um, can the court system wait that long for the defence lawyers to take on legal aid cases? And how you, or will you, as Justice Minister, address the court backlogs? Well, first, that the first part of your question is, is incorrect. So legal aid is fully funded. Um, government is one contributing partner to, to legal aid. Um, legal aid did have a large surplus, and of course the contributing partners, including the government, want to make sure that the surplus is used. Legal aid and, and the CEO, John Panusa, has said it uh, publicly himself that legal aid is fully funded. They have the dollars that they need. What's being advocated right now by the criminal defense bar is moving forward before the tariff modernization review is completed, which is going to be in October. So we're not that far away. This began in May, um, but they're asking for us to take one part of how the criminal defense bar is compensated and to make a decision before the rest of the review is done. So uh, the advice that I've received from uh, civil servants and legal aid is that if we were to make that decision now before that review is completed, it would undermine the rest of the review. So I think it's important for us to make sure that the review is completed. We're not that far away from it being completed in October. And um, I've, I've always said to the criminal defense bar that we're willing to have conversations about whether um, there are, you know, need to be increases in the tariff or whether there need to be changes to the, uh, the financial eligibility guidelines. But I think that's the next step after the review in October is completed. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing uh, no more questions in the room, uh, operator, can you please put through the first caller? Global. Hey there, Minister. I have a question as well on legal aid. I'm wondering if you had any conversations um, over the weekend about this, and uh, I know you're talking about that review being done in October. Do you expect anything to be done before that review is released? Well, I, I think when we're, we're talking about what's being asked for by the criminal defense bar, I think what they're asking for would undermine that review. So um, I think it's important for us to complete that review. Um, and then uh, I think there are opportunities for us to uh, sit down with legal aid and here uh, we've heard the advocacy from the crim criminal defense bar that there need to be changes to uh, how they're compensated and uh, whether there need to be changes to the, the FEGS, the, the financial eligibility guidelines. That's the next step. And uh, I I've, I've sat down with the um, three of the organizations that represent portions of the criminal defense bar who are rostered lawyers. and. Uh, told them that I'm, I'm willing to uh, hear their advocacy and, and understand if there are changes that need to be made and how they're compensated or the, the FEGS. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up? I do, thank you. With um, legal aid lawyers saying that they're not going to take any new cases, I'm wondering whether there are any plans from your department to um, fill any gaps or whether you're really taking any action uh, to mitigate any issues that people might have. And then also just wondering, uh, are you confident that the review is going to be done on time in October? I know sometimes reviews are delayed. Sure, I'll, I'll answer in reverse order. I mean, I've received no indication that there is any undue delay to, to that review being completed. Um, the first part of the question, yes, we have been monitoring with legal aid. Um, we have to remember that there are 1,200 lawyers who are rostered, who take certificates. Um, and, and obviously a portion of those lawyers are represented by different organizations, including the three who have been advocating for um, this, uh, this change in how they're compensated. Um, we, we're monitoring how many lawyers are taking certificates and making sure that legal aid have the, the lawyers uh, available within the roster to take, um, take files and make sure that Albertans who need, uh, need legal aid um, have that access to justice. So we will continue to, to monitor the situation and we will continue to hear the advocacy from the, the criminal defense bar. Thank you. Thank you. Operator, please put through the next caller. Bill Coffin, Post Media. 
Yes. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering if you could give us a dollar figure as to what, um, uh, how much it would cost a province to facilitate these uh, seizures of these firearms. Well, um, we, we at first were advised by civil servants at Public Safety Canada that this was something that they were considering and making the direction to the RCMP. Um, I, I suppose that, that depend on, on what the directions from Public Safety Canada might have been to the RCMP. Um, so I, I don't know a specific, specific quantum at this time, but um, I think the, the main point, though, is if we're going to spend, as Albertans, $750 million dollars, on the RCMP that it's got to be focused on making sure it's spent on making our community safer. Thank you, Bill. Do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I mean, do you think this this wrangle over these these firearms is is this another way for you to argue for a provincial police force? Well, I, I see them as, as separate. Um, I see them as separate issues, Bill. Um, and, but what we do have right now is we are a province, one of seven provinces who do contract out our, our provincial policing. We all have the same identical PPSA, Provincial Policing Service Agreement, with, uh, with Canada. And when we negotiated this back between 2007 and, and 2012, there are um, certain clauses within there that, that provide us as a province, since it is provincial jurisdiction, with certain rights. And we are definitely going to use um, those opportunities within the agreement to stand up for Albertans and in particular the, the law-abiding um, property owners who have those uh, firearms. Thank you. Operator, please put through the next caller. Catherine Grigowski, Alberta Today. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. I'm hoping you can elaborate on this, um, those, those arguments you're, you're hoping to make. So what is it in the Provincial Police Service Agreement um, that what is in there that would allow you to not enforce a federal law or federal direction or to direct the RCMP to to not do it? Can you can you just explain that for me? Sure. So the the PPSA allows us to identify for the uh, RCMP an objective priority or goal of the province or and what what it, in particular is not an an activity. And so uh, after advising the RCMP of that, we would expect that the RCMP then would um, listen to, to us and, and refuse to participate if we identify the confiscation program as not being a priority uh, objective or goal under uh, provincial police service. If then uh, the next step would be that Canada still tries to conscript the RCMP in being um, being agents to confiscate firearms, then the, the next clause we would be uh, seeking to use would be Article 23, which would be the dispute resolution clause. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I mean, what, what do you think that, what message is that going to send to people who are lawful firearms? Like, are, are you concerned for those officers who, who are conscripted and are going to go to people's doors <laughs> and try to try to grab their guns or whatever. Like, what what effect is that going to have when people are already very riled up and sensitive about this issue? Well, well, first of all, we have to remember that the the entire um, point behind the the policy that was developed by Canada was was wrong headed. Uh, none of this is focused on keeping our community safe. Uh, we have the federal government proposing to, to ban historical artifacts like flint and lock firearms. Um, Catherine, I mean, the last time someone committed a crime with a flint and lock firearm, um, he was wearing a patch and had a parrot on his shoulder. Um, it, this is not about keeping our community safe. This is a, it's, it's pure politics from the perspective of the, the federal government. And I think it's important for us to make sure that the money that we spend on, on provincial policing is focused on provincial policing and not wrong-headed policy ideas that the federal government is trying to, to impose upon us. Thank you very much. We have time for one more caller, operator. Steve Kaiser, CTV. Good afternoon. Uh, Minister, I want to go back to what you said a few questions ago there. You said the main objective here is to make sure policing dollars go towards policing. So what I'm unclear about, does that mean if the feds inject more money into Alberta, 
specifically to enforce this and have those uh, confiscation agents, you'd actually enforce it and be in favor of it? No, no. I I think what we're saying, and and that's why we're also uh, intervening in the six judicial reviews, because even if Canada does continue um, with this wrong-headed policy idea, that we will continue to um, advocate for um, firearms uh, legally, uh, uh, lawfully um, obtained uh, firearms within Alberta to by by um, intervening or seeking to intervene in the um, in these six uh, judicial reviews and continue to advocate for sensible policy that reduces gun crime in Alberta and Canada rather than. Uh, policies that uh, are not going to make our communities any safer. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up? Yeah. I mean, Minister, there's no right to bear arms in in, in, in Canada. Firearms regulation is all federal. It's up to uh, the discretion of the federal government whether or not, or rather how far those gun rights go. So if the federal government wants to change those laws, I mean, I... I, I, I'm a little confused at what you think asking the RCMP to not enforce it will actually do. Th- th- this kind of sounds almost like Danielle Smith's Alberta Sovereignty Act. No, no, Safe. It's, this is, first of all, us making sure that the money that we spend on policing is spent on policing. And second, if the federal government is going to propose policy and, and legislation that we think isn't in the best interests of um, of community safety, then we have the ability to at least ask the court to allow us to intervene and to be able to make sensible arguments in front of the court representing the best interests of Albertans. So that is, that is why we would be seeking that opportunity to intervene because we think we can um, provide um, a perspective with, in the courtroom to represent Albertans and, and make sure that what is decided by the federal government when it comes to um, legislation related to firearms is going to be focused on community safety. Thanks, Dave. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you, everyone, for coming today. Uh, this concludes our, uh, our press conference this afternoon. Thank you.